श्री प्रधान माय कॉलीग जयंत प्रसाद डिस्टिंग्विश्ड गेस्ट लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक मिस्टर प्रधान फॉर दो दैट वेरी जेनरस इंट्रोडक्शन वॉट एवर डॉक्टर मनमोहन सिंह मे हैव सेट टू हिम नेवर सेट टू मी एट लीस्ट सो आई एम ग्लैड दैट दिस वॉज कन्वेड टू मी सेकेंड हैंड सो आई हैव बीन आस टू डिलीवर द वाई बी चवान मेमोरियल लेक्चर फॉर दिस ईयर थैंक यू फॉर इन्वाइटिंग मी टू डिलीवर दिस लेक्चर इन ऑनर ऑफ वन ऑफ द ग्रेट सन्स ऑफ इंडिया श्री यशवंत राव चवान जी हुज कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशंस टू नेशन बिल्डिंग इन इंडिया व बोथ फार रीचिंग एंड सब्सटैंशल Uh, he was among the stalwarts of the post independence generation of leaders who retained their grassroots <coughs> sensibilities even while making their mark at the state and the national level yashwant rao ji served as chief minister of maharashtra but then took on the challenging assignment as india's defense minister in the aftermath of the 1962 india china war which him which uh, ended in a humiliating setback for indian forces in his four years as raksha mantri he made a major contribution to building the nation's military capabilities the infrastructure at our borders and also restoring the badly hit morale of the defense forces and this is what enabled the country to give a befitting response to pakistani aggression in 1965 and help restore confidence in our defense uh, forces in his long and distinguished uh, political career shri chavan headed several key ministries at the center these include the ministries of finance external affairs deputy prime minister and home affairs in maharashtra he is well known for his contribution to the cooperative movement which has been a notable success story <clears throat> i am happy to note that the yashwant rao chavan pratisthan has done yeoman service in perpetuating his memory and disseminating his contributions to virtually all spheres of national endeavor it is my privilege to deliver this year's annual lecture to honor his memory the, the subject that i have chosen to speak on uh, this afternoon is the decline of internationalism uh why did i choose this subject because i am very much intrigued by what is a very curious paradox of our time the world is more densely interconnected our destinies as countries and peoples are more intertwined and the challenges that we confront cut across regional and national boundaries more than at any other time in human history the nation state endures and will probably continue to do so in the foreseeable future however the concept of national sovereignty which is integral to the concept of nation state is increasingly conditioned indeed constrained by the reality that the line between the domestic and the external is becoming increasingly blurred our economies are impacted by developments far from our shores as was painfully evident during the global financial and economic crisis of 2007 2008 our share markets respond as much to movements on the new york exchange as to developments in our own economy uh let us take another area like say public health a pandemic may break out in some remote corner of uh, africa but may spread spread to ravage distant parts of the globe uh climate change which we are very concerned about these days climate change is a global phenomenon but impacts on each country locally and it can only be addressed through global and collaborative measures one could say the same about many other contemporary challenges whether it is international terrorism or drug trafficking <coughs> international crime uh, natural or man man made disasters frequently range across national boundaries so and national governance structures are no longer adequate to deal with their consequences that is the reality that we face the interconnectedness of the globe <clears throat> through the wonders of digital 
technology, the instantaneousness of communication and its increasingly visual character and the expanding reach and influence of social media beyond the control of states has vastly expanded the scale of what I call unregulated domains. Our lives are dominated by cyberspace. Cyberspace in turn depends upon a network of terrestrial and undersea fiber optic cables, space-based uh, satellites. These networks operate in either unregulated or only partially regulated domains. By their very nature, they are not amenable to national control and regulation or are partially so. It is apparent that the efficacy of national governance has been shrinking thanks to the impact of accelerated technological change and the irreversible globalization of our economies. And yet, international institutions and processes to enable the governance of the newer and expanding cross-national domains not only lag behind, but their very rationale is under attack. There is something of a worldwide backlash against globalization and a perversive pervasive yearning for a past with a familiar political, social, and cultural anchors. Uh, U.S. analyst George Friedman has recently, in, a, in an article, he has said, quote, the nation state is reasserting itself as the primary vehicle of political life. Multilateral, insti multilateral institutions like the European Union and multilateral trade treaties are being challenged because they are seen by some as not being in the national interest." Unquote. <clears throat> this uh, reassertion uh, is really, to my mind, chaotic. Chaotic because the drivers of cross-border challenges are technological and economic and are now so deeply embedded in our lives as individuals and communities that they cannot be unraveled again. It is trying to put the genie back in the bottle. The ecological, economic, and strategic challenges of the new millennium can only be tackled through governance at the international scale. And that demands a spirit of internationalism which can temper and transcend the nationalist urges which unchecked may threaten human survival itself. Internationalism is not a new concept. <coughs> it has been around for a long time but in different incarnations. Fred Halliday, uh, who is an uh, international affairs scholar, has explored its contemporary forms since the Westphalian state became the norm. There is, in his definition, uh, a, quote, liberal internationalism, unquote, which is rooted in the political economy and inspired by traditional 18th century, 19th century appeals to free trade and international cooperation, but amongst equal partners. Such internationalism obviously excluded the vast majorities of countries and territories under colonial rule and imperial subjugation. Then there is, quote, hegemonic internationalism, <coughs> shaped by, quote, real politic acceptance of asymmetry of international relations and the necessarily dominant new colonial rule role that rich and powerful countries have to play in enforcing and policing internationalism, unquote. And the US-led, of course, World War II international order uh, is, a, is an example of this. Then he has a third category, which is the radical and revolutionary internationalism inspired initially by Marxist theory, through mob though mobilized in different forms, during the last millennium by a range of ideologically motivated entities, their objective being overthrow of the existing order. To Halliday's list, of course, I would add the internationalism promoted by countries emerging from colonial rule, inspired by ideas of equity, solidarity, and shared peace and prosperity. And the non-aligned movement, while it lasted until the end of the Cold War, was an expression of internationalism based on shared concerns, aspirations, and providing an alternative narrative to Halliday's hegemonic internationalism. All these versions of internationalism are state-centric, but rooted in specific geopolitical circumstances. Each of these versions has lost relevance as geopolitics has mutated. 
liberal internationalism of the 19th century was too narrowly based to survive in a world of free sovereign states but lacking in equality of partnerships. The radical and revolutionary internationalism associated with socialist states lost steam with the demise of the Soviet Union and China's turn to state capitalism and market economics. <clears throat> the non-aligned movement mostly evaporated after the end of the Second World War and developing country solidarity began to be seen as an idealistic and unrealistic construct. And hegemonic internationalism underpinned by US power is now in decline as the relative predominance of the US itself diminishes and multiple centers of power emerge to challenge the existing geopolitical order. As the US and West progressively lose the Siraj benefits which have been anchored in Western ascendancy of institutions and processes of international governance, there is a relapse into nationalism and attempted revival of an imagined past. We are confronted with an elemental dilemma precisely at a time in the history of mankind when we need much stronger and more effective international institutions and processes <clears throat> to deal with a completely new set of challenges. The balance between nationalism and internationalism has tilted heavily in the, in the, in the direction of uh, nationalism. This is happening across the world and there is a fragmentation of the global space accompanied by a polarization of attitudes in country after country, and that does not exclude India either. These are all interlinked phenomena. One exists because of the other. If unchecked, these trends portend a future of confrontation and conflict in which the very technologies which have brought unprecedented affluence and convenience to ever larger segments of the world's populations could turn into instruments of death and destruction. There are already intimations of this in the unspeakable and barbaric horrors we have seen unleashed in West Asia. It is difficult to moderate nationalism in the absence of a countervailing internationalism which captures the imagination of people as a cultural, historical and political idea. Benedict Anderson analyzed with great insight the notion of nationalism. He has a book called Imagined Communities. <coughs> he said that a nation, <coughs> quote, is a socially constructed community imagined by people who perceive themselves as part of the group, unquote. The reality, he pointed out, is that through the historian, the nation is a very modern construct, having emerged uh, mostly after the uh, Industrial Revolution. However, as we witness in our own country, to the nationalist, the state is characterized by what he calls subjective antiquity, unquote. Nationalism can mobilize immense political power, but is usually devoid of philosophical underpinning and lacks coherence. Anderson goes on to say, quote, a nation is a community because regardless of the actual inequality and exploitation that may prevail in each the nation is always conceived of as a deep horizontal comradeship. Ultimately, it is this fraternity which makes it possible over the past two centuries for so many millions of people not so much to kill as willing to die for such limited imaginings." Unquote. Is it any wonder why political leaders are tempted to use nationalism as an instrument of political control despite threatened dangers? It is not one's argument that nationalism must be banished in order to cope with the emerging and continually transforming world. In any case, it is too powerful a force to deconstruct at the present time. How do we find a new balance <coughs> with internationalism? What kind of internationalism will be relevant to our times? August Bebel, who was a leader of the German Social Democratic Party, and a socialist ideologue in the early, uh, early 19th century grappled with this dilemma and came up with some very perceptive observations. He said that international, internationalism did not mean, un, mean, quote, the suppression of nationalities, not the violent fusion of nations, 
but the upholding and the progress of pacific relations of civilization among nations. Bebel offered a definition of patriotism which flows from nationalism. That's because nationalism and patriotism are very closely connected, so I thought I'll, I'll explore this a little further. He says, quote, the man is a patriot who tries to obtain for the nation to which he belongs by his birth, his language, and his customs without hurting or injuring any other nation. That's the highest civilization in the interest of all. Patriotism and internationalism are not necessarily antagonistic, but supplement each other, marking towards a more and more perfect civilization." Unquote. Therefore, we need to nurture a political discourse which refrains from rejecting or disparaging nationalism and patriotism, even while upholding internationalism. Now, in a, in a comment about the kind of uh, forces that we see unleashed uh, in, the, in the present time, uh, one of the regular uh, contributors to the International uh, New York Times, Ross uh, Dutat, uh, he had wrote uh, recently uh, why you know, uh, this, this churn is happening uh, in the world, particularly in, in the United States and even the West. And he says, uh, people have a desire for solidarity that cosmopolitanism does not satisfy. Of course, cosmopolitanism is the major main feature of, of the interconnected world that I am talking about. Uh, but that, that cosmopolitan does not satisfy the desire for solidarity. Uh, immaterial interest that redistribution cannot meet. And a yearning for the sacred that secularism cannot answer. Unquote. Uh, very perceptive, uh, uh, actually, analysis. Uh, this results from the undeniable fact that the pace of technological change has accelerated beyond the capacity of the human psyche and social mores to adapt. The search for familiar anchors is understandable. However, quote, globalization is a bell that cannot be unrung, unquote. We are no longer in a world where countries can cocoon themselves and survive. Nor can pursuit of perceived domestic interests prevail over external engagement. In fact, external engagement may well be indispensable to achieving domestic ends since the salience of issues cutting across national and regional borders and with an intrinsically global dimension has increased phenomenally. The yearning for national control the harking back to an imagined historical, social and cultural identity such as we have seen in the Brexit vote in the UK and the more recent elections in the US will inevitably end in frustrated expectations. For the West, globalization was embraced as long as it reinforced Western ascendancy, but it became threatening when it spawned other centers of political and economic power. Making America great again in the same mold as in the post-World War II era is no longer possible. Nor is the Chinese dream as articulated by Xi Jinping possible, because that is not the logical destination of the globalization of the Chinese economy. It is a regression to a past glory which lingers on in the Chinese psyche, but is unattainable in a vastly different geopolitical terrain. It is only a new internationalism which enables the benefit of globalization to be shared equitably, mitigates the negative fallout and adjusts existing governance regimes as well as emerging ones to accommodate all stakeholders which could bring relative peace and prosperity. Multilateral institutions and processes will then no longer be a platform for a contest of competing nationalisms but will reflect the spirit of internationalism without which multilateralism is condemned to deliver least common denominator results. India's first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru was a fervent nationalist, but he was also a committed internationalist. His ideal was a, quote, collectivism which neither degrades nor enslaves, unquote. The Indian concept of Vasudev Kutumbakam or universal brotherhood, which Nehru kept harking back again and again. Uh, in his view, this is what was needed to meet the challenge of the post-atomic world with its threat of universal annihilation. Uh, 
So universal brotherhood as an answer to universal annihilation or prospect of universal annihilation. Nehru's vision of India was for a country at peace with itself, a democracy which guaranteed fundamental rights of the individual, which enabled its citizens to pursue their own genius, and a federal polity which incorporated the ideal of unity in diversity. But more importantly, Nehru located India's quest as part of a global endeavor for peace and development. To quote his well-known and what today are truly prescient words, quote, and so we have to labor and to work to give reality to our dreams. These dreams are for India, but they are also for the world. For all the nations and people are too closely knit together today for any one of them to imagine that it can live apart. Peace has been said to be indivisible. So is freedom. So is prosperity now. And so is disaster in this world, one world which can no longer be split into fragments." Unquote. I do not pretend to know how one could bridge the disconnect between the reality of the one world we inhabit today and the wave of intolerance, sectarian and racial hatred, and the grossness of political discourse which is sweeping across country after country in the world. I do know, however, that India could, if it so resolves, <clears throat> lead the way to shaping a new world order which is aligned with the challenges we confront as humanity. For through the ages, India has developed a civilization whose attributes are what really the new order requires the innate syncretism of its accommodative and self-confident culture, its easy embrace of vast diversity and plurality with an underlying spiritual and cultural unity, and a deep conviction, and I feel that this is very important, a deep conviction that to achieve greatness, a nation must stand for something more than itself. The first generation of India's post-independent leaders, including Yashwant Rao Chavanji, inculcated the values which Nehru embodied and steered India, India in a direction which won it respect even from its detractors. We work on a much narrower agenda now and seek to advance India's interests without much thought to our place in the larger interlinked and interdependent world. <clears throat> in the context of the ecological challenges we confront as humanity, it has been said that if we as a species fail to halt and reverse the ravaging of the earth we inhabit, then we face a cataclysmic and irreversible consequences. <clears throat> and yet in a world where each national leader wants to make his country great again, there may well be a future in which greatness will have become irrelevant in every sense of the term. In words of belated wisdom, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said recently, uh, this was with respect to, you know, the ecological emergency that the world is facing, that uh, for the world, there is no plan B since there is no planet B. Nationalism without internationalism is the road to a dead end. I thank you for your attention.